All right, enough of that. Let's go to our Bible study for this evening. Let me have you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Nehemiah, chapter 8. Nehemiah 8, and uh, let's read the first five verses as we get started here. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded, to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could un that hear with understanding, upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday, before the men and women, excuse me, and the women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Ananiah and Urijah and Hilkiah and Maasiah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Pedeah and Mishael and uh, Malkiah and Hashem and Hashbadana, Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, parentheses, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Now, that's where you get the suggestion by a lot of churches to stand for the reading of the Word of God at the beginning of the sermon. Well, if you have to tell them to stand, then it's not falling into place naturally. These people stood out of um, an awe and um, absolute um, uh, trembling or fear at the power of the Word of God, which had been withheld from them for so long. And there was nobody saying, now everyone stand. When Ezra starts to read, there was none of that necessary. And notice a few elements to, these, to this scene. Uh, the passage is a good one, outlining how a worship service uh, should be conducted. The word pulpit makes its one and only appearance in the Bible, verse 4. The original definition was not a, a podium or a lectern someone stood behind, but it meant an elevated platform or raised platform that a person stood on. So that was probably between three to five feet higher than the uh, ground level of the people. So verse 5 says, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. However, this worship service was up to six hours long. Verse 3 says, from morning until midday. There is no modern American congregation that could stand a Sunday morning worship service that went on for six hours. In my day job, we go to a lot of churches for uh, uh, different denominations, different ethnicities, and, uh, and with due respect, the black folks worship a lot longer than us white folks do. But I don't think any black congregation wants to stay there for six hours, especially when food's getting cold over in the fellowship hall. But uh, Ezra's service doesn't depend on gimmicks or giveaways or games or some lame rock group called the Praise Band, while everyone sits there passively watching a big screen, uh, trying to follow along the seven words on the screen. And there's no nobody warming up the audience. That's what Joel Osteen does at his big uh, church in Texas. He has someone come out there with music for half an hour, 45 minutes, tell a few stories. Sometimes they have a Christian comedian to get people sort of in the relaxed mood. And then Pastor Joel comes out there smiling um, with nothing to say. But um, so nobody's doing that. They're, all they do is they try to copy the late night comedians by getting people in the mood for the entertainment that's going to follow later. And the people aren't shallow. They're not fickle here, uh, disappointed because they didn't get a Danish during the break time. Uh, a lot, who knows the reason people show up for church these days or go to some gathering called a church meeting. And it could be any number of reasons uh, that have nothing to do with the Word of God or pleasing the Lord God by prayer and supplications. 
um, this is a worship service. This worship service, let me see, um, wasn't about the cucumbers, the leeks, the garlics, uh, and the onions and the melons. Like I mentioned Numbers chapter 11. This one was all about manna. This, this meeting was all about manna, being fed from the Word of God. Uh, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Psalm 119, verse 18 says, And the entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, 130 tells us. I want you to notice Numbers 21. You want to run back there. Numbers 21. Numbers 21 and verse 5. Numbers 21, verse 5, it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt, to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. That's what they thought of the man that God was supplying for them day after day after day. Run, if you will, forward to the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy and chapter 4. Second Timothy 4 and the first four verses there. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's what modern Christianity thinks of the Bible. That's what modern Christianity thinks of the Word of God. That's why you have um, so-called ministers who have, who have joined the uh, Bible of the Month Club. Like that church I told you about earlier today I was at, they had six different translations of the Bible for sale in their church bookstore, which means they don't believe any one of those is the perfect Word of God from cover to cover. Because what would they do if two of them contradict each other? Who's to decide which one's right, which one's wrong? And the idea, well, I mean, our pastor's pretty smart. Let's let him give me some advice. That means he's the final authority. So now you have seven authorities, not just six. That's what happens when people haven't decided that one book is the perfect word of God, come hell or high water, and, and I'm going to depend upon God and the Holy Spirit to teach this book to me. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a Bible believer. And... I think I said recently, it's a free country. You can use any version of the Bible you want, but for goodness sake, believe it. The idea that we adopt a new version every five or six years because it is a new one on the market, and uh, our pastor's got a lot of clout, and people recommend, people listen to him, and what he recommends something, people latch on to it. If he says it must be okay to read that one, fine. Then it must be okay to read it. So you've See, Christians nowadays, they've got a whole shelf of modern translations. They, they couldn't quote a verse from any of them because they know in a few years another version is going to come out. So don't commit to one because you might have to stop and start memorizing out of a new one. That person's not a Bible believer. They're not even a Bible user. They're just a collector of books. That's all it comes, around, comes down to. But uh, all Ezra had, alongside his deacons on the left hand and the right hand, uh, verse 4, was a book. That's all he had. And according to verse 3, this was the book of the law, back in our text, which means that some conviction is about to be preached to the people. <coughs> Romans chapter 3 states, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified, and a great um, a truth for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So what Ezra is getting ready to read to the people, 
what was called the law of God, is going to expose what they've been doing, what they haven't been doing, what their obligations to the Lord have been, and what they hadn't been fulfilling. Uh, let's continue in our back in our text, Nehemiah 8, and verses 6 through 8. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their heads to the ground, or excuse me, with their faces to the ground. And Jeshua and Bani and Shebiah and Jamin and Achab, uh, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Maasiah, Keliah, Azariah, Jezebad, Hanan, Peleah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And I'm glad every verse isn't loaded with uh, unpronounceable names, like verse 7 was there. <laughs> verse 6 says, Ezra, bless the Lord. That means he undoubtedly began things by praying. If you have a pastor that isn't in the regular habit of praying, well, why should anyone listening to him be? And they lifted their hands while doing this. Oh, well, I, I neglected that double amens. Amen, amen. It's good to hear amens. Everybody likes to hear amens. It, amen. Yeah, there you go. Okay. And uh, it's unfortunate when there aren't more. And uh, I can get the young people to say amen, but uh, sometimes I wonder about some of you who are older, uh, I need to hear you more. <laughs> but uh, that means so be it. Whatever has been said up to this point, so be it. May it be so, God. And they lifted their hands while doing this. You know, the, the uh, stretching forth of the hands toward heaven was the Old Testament posture for prayer. Uh, run back, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings 8. And one example of this, 1 Kings 8, verse 22. 1 Kings 8, verse 22. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel, uh, and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And what the charismatics like to do is they like to, you know, I'm a little teacup type stuff, you know. Um, but that is not how the hands were spread in the Old Testament times. The hands were spread like this, in a, as an act of surrender to God. Yielded to God, uh, for lack of a better uh, term, in an act of surrender. Then, uh, at the end of the amening, they all bow their heads and look at the ground. Look at a few texts that I'll call your attention to. Go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 23. Exodus 23, and verse 24 says, Exodus 23, verse 24, Thou shalt not bow down to, uh, to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overturn them, and quite break down their images. 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 18. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself to excuse me, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, uh, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And that verse gave me great comfort many years ago, and I say many, well, about 32 years ago to be more precise, when I started working in the funeral business, and I discovered that it was sort of customary to genuflect towards the image of Jesus on the cross. My supervisor that was training me, and I, neither of us, were Roman Catholics, but they sort of expect to see people do that, and maybe they've loosened up 
over the last 30 years. But I wrestle with that. I wrestle with that. And Lord, I don't worship that. I don't want to do that. But I realized if two of us go to, to the front of the church at the end of a funeral, and we're going to bring the casket out of the church, and one of us does it, the other one doesn't, then it's going to look unbalanced. And I was reading my Bible. I came across that passage and um, where Naaman, the leper, was healed, and he's asking Elisha to pray to the Lord that the Lord would forgive him when he has to bow down for his master to the false god. And uh, he simply said, you know, the Lord pardon thy sir, go thy way. And uh, nothing more to be worried about after that. That gave me, gave me a great deal of comfort at that time. I realized that's the verse I needed to tell me, you know, the Lord's man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And uh, so I realized didn't matter what I did just for the sake of getting getting through my job. The Lord knew I didn't believe in that. I don't believe in statues. I don't believe in anything like that. I consider it to be a false, empty religion anyway. So it can't affect me. It has no power to bless me or curse me or put any hex on me. Um, the Roman Catholic religion is a stage play in three acts. They start in the back of the church, the priest and his costumes, and his altar service and their costumes. They're holding candles or they're holding the holy water or, or something. And they have a prop in their hand and they proceed up in a pre-planned format. And they start in the back of the church and they proceed forward. It's like the opening scene in a, in a play. This grand opening and the people are sitting in their seats uh, wondering what's going to happen next. The same thing that happened the last 364 days of the year. Um, it never changes. It never varies. And, uh, and people leave there thinking there was a great spiritual uh, presence there. There might have been a spiritual presence there, but it wasn't in the Holy Spirit. That's for sure. But, um, yeah, all right, I'm getting off my on a rabbit trail here. Go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, just a way of illustrating the posture. Psalm 95, verse 5. Yeah, verse 6, I'm sorry. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. All right, thank you. And, of course, uh, Philippians 2, verse 10, tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow one day. You recall the uh, Luke 18, verse 13, said, And the publican, standing far off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And the animation of these verses that these people in Ezra's day were down on all fours, their face to the ground, or at least on their knees, to show their humility. Uh, a couple of other verses. Uh, yeah, we don't need to go to other verses for time's sake. Anyway, the congregation then stands up. Uh, verse 7. Um, the 13 translators, that would be the 12 on either side of Ezra, plus Ezra and the Levites, begin to read the scriptures and to translate for the people, the benefit of those who were Persians or Aramaic or Babylonian, those Jews who had been raised speaking those languages since before the regathering in Palestine. Uh, the reading is done in three stages. According to the verse 8, it says, They read in the book of the law of God distinctly. as to read the words slowly and deliberately exactly as they're written and printed and gave the sense, the sense of the text, so that it made sense to the listener, and caused the congregation to understand the reading. That would have to do with making application of what they just read, what they just heard, to the men 
and to the women to give the congregation an understanding of what the passage means in relationship to them. Uh, run forward, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy Four and verse 13, Paul writes to Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And Second Timothy, which we read earlier, but let's read it again. Second Timothy 4, verses 1 to 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. That's the day and age in which we live. <clears throat> the result of all of this scripture reading is conviction and tears shed down to verse 9 in this text tonight. Uh, let's read verses 9 through 12. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites, that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, the day is holy neither be ye grieved. All the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. It's often been called the um, unhappy work of the Holy Spirit. As John chapter 16 you don't need to turn. John 16, and two verses there, verses 8 and 9, speaking of the Holy Spirit. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. There's always negative, something negative, before there can be something positive. You cannot love cleanliness unless you hate dirt. Both of them have to exist alongside each other. And not everything about being a believer, a Christian, someone who knows that they're saved, not everything in the life of a true believer is positive and enjoyable and pleasant and easy to uh, endure and fun. Everything wants, everyone wants something to be fun. That word is so overused. I work in a funeral home, so I said, I put the fun in funeral. And uh, I don't know if they like that or not, but I do it anyway. But unless you're reproved and rebuked, you're not going to receive the instruction of God that God wants to give. There was one verse in the Old Testament that says, break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. You can't hope to have a successful flower garden or vegetable garden if everything is hard and rocky or sandy and the soil hasn't been properly prepared and tilled and turned over and getting stones and rocks out of the way and weeds out of the way to prepare that to receive the seed and to, to bring forth the best possible crop uh, that you can possibly bring forth. And so it is with people. So it is with your heart. God wants you to uh, re receive 
what's written in the Bible as it's written. Don't second guess it. Don't doubt it. Don't change it. Don't say, I don't agree with it. I'm going to get a new translation. I'm going to get a new Bible. I'm going to stop reading my Bible. Uh, take it the way God gives it to you and trust the Holy Spirit will nurture it and bring forth fruit in you by it. Very few churches look at their spiritual obligations to the Lord that way. And i, I got to tell you, through my, my day job, I'm going to churches all the time. And this is their approach to calling themselves believers, a Christian. Remember I said recently there's a difference between being saved and being a Christian. A lot of people can be saved. Getting saved is one of the most simple propositions in the, in the universe. Trusting the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did uh, in your place, on your behalf, for the sake of your sin, that's easy. God wants to save sinners. But it's like the differences between your standing and your state. Your standing, you might be a true believer. You, can, you know when and where and how and the day and the time and the circumstances that you trusted Christ to be your Savior. But your state, your state of affairs, how are you living as a Christian? Is it in such a way that brings honor to the Lord Jesus Christ and honor to the, the name of Jesus Christ? It's not a badge of shame or embarrassment to your fellow Christians, but you're, you're the kind that they're proud of. They emulate. They wish they were more sanctified and set apart for God that, uh, like you are. Because they see you, they say, this is what I want to do. That's how I want to be. That's what God would want of me. Or are they the kind that say, well, I don't want anything to do with him. I'm not like him. I'm not like her. Uh, we're totally different. Uh, please don't judge me by his stumbling or her stumbling. But there's always got to be something negative to expose sin. That's the word reprove before something positive comes about. Um, to reprove is to expose the error of something, not just for the sake of belittling someone or humiliating them, but to expose the error of something or someone in hopes of making it right once again. Because that's the intention, to make it right. I wouldn't say these things just to hurt your feelings, but I'm saying these things because I want the best from you. I want God to be able to use you and for you to be fruitful for his sake uh, in, in a way that, that you're not going to be if you continue doing this thing or doing that thing. I'm going to confess something that uh, I don't think I've ever talked to my wife about. But she, if I did, it's been so many years. When we moved to Pensacola, 1990, and I began going to Bible school there, uh, that first few months, uh, I was working and going to school at night, but she was home with two little ones and all day long. I know she had to be going out of her mind and separated from her family. And so she wanted to come back to California to visit her mom and family at uh, Christmas time for a few weeks. And uh, that few weeks turned into a few months, but... Um, you know, at first I thought, well, she couldn't stick it out. She couldn't stick. I should have thought that because I, I, I wasn't sitting at home all day with two little ones like she was. And I didn't appreciate what she was going through. But during that three months, and I had just started going to school two or three months uh, prior to that. There's a Hardy's. I think it's the Carl's Jr. on the East Coast. Hard, Carl's is Hardee's, uh, west of the Mississippi. So uh, there's a Hardee's near Nine Mile Road, University Road. Elizabeth knows where that is. I'd go there, get a cup of coffee and do some reading and sit there for an hour. I had nothing to do. And, uh, you know, you, you do that. I was a young man. Here comes employees on their breaks. Oh, hey, Mike, can I sit down? So, Next thing you know, girl's a, a manager, a, a shift manager, close in age. She sits out there, and nothing untoward took place, though. Let me, let me clarify. 
But I was a little too friendly, I guess. It was noticeable. Not, not realizing one of the fellows from PBI, it was a teacher, was in there, saw me talking to this girl. So that night at school, he called me into his office and said, Brother Shrive, I want to talk to you about something. And he very kindly described what he had seen me doing, being friendly with this girl that he knew wasn't my wife, and my wife was out of town for a couple of months. And does that look right? I said, you know, you're right, that doesn't look right. And I said, I, you're, you caught me, I'm, I'm completely, I have no excuse for that. I, I, should, I know better, and uh, I guess I was just foolhardy. And we prayed together, and uh, from that moment until 2016, 2017, Elizabeth and I went and got hamburgers there. I hadn't, I never went back to that restaurant, never even went in to say hello, and then went through the drive through and Brother Ford became one of my uh, best friends and instructors at PVI. He, he and I became good friends after that. I think he realized that I had taken his reproof in the spirit he tried to uh, convey it, and I'm glad that I did. And, uh, but and that's the purpose of a reproof, to expose something that's wrong in hopes of making it right again. But Paul says reprove, rebuke. A rebuke is more strong than a reproof. A rebuke is to ball somebody out, to tell them off, because they won't listen to reproof. They won't accept reproof. Uh, you can expose something, like they've always got some way to justify themselves or rationalize their actions. Uh, and long-suffering, of course, that's, that's patience above and beyond. I've been putting up with that, putting up with that, putting up with that person's uh, behavior, putting up with that person's actions, putting up with that person's deeds. And there comes a time you've got to speak up and say no more. Long-suffering and, Paul says, doctrine, New Testament. Doctrine would be the whole Bible's teaching on any given subject. That's the best definition of the word doctrine you could find, is the complete Bible's teaching on any given subject. Now, I'll grant you, there are some subjects where there are only three or four verses that deal with it in the Bible, and others where there are hundreds of verses that deal with it. So some are more uh, involved and, and complicated than others. An exhortation uh, to exhort, that is to plead and to, and to uh, uh, persuade, to do right and, and admonish someone to do right and uh, steer them in the direction to help them do right, to know what the right thing is, to make the right decision. And all of those things uh, should be done by the man who would speak for God for the benefit of others who want to hear and need to know, need to hear. So reproof, rebuke, exhortations, long-suffering, doctrine, all of those things. And then verse 12 in our text tonight should be self-explanatory. Let's read it one more time anyway. All the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth why? Because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. It's wonderful, either through the sermon of someone else or the Holy Spirit revealing something as you read the Bible, to suddenly say, you know, I think I get it now. And it's amazing how certain things we, we read over and over again, and it takes sometimes years for it to jump out at us. Amen. You wonder, why, why didn't I see that the first time through? Acts 16, verse 31. 
uh, verse 30, the, the Philippian jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And I've heard people preach sermons and outlines about that. Well, this is family salvation. If the head of the household is a committed Christian, then um, that means that his whole household are protected by God in some sort of covenant. When they credit, and get all sort of all sorts of crazy ways to explain that last part of the verse, and thy house. Um, it simply means, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And the same thing goes for your family. If they believe on him, they'll be saved. That's all it means. Why that didn't jump out at me the first ten times I was reading through that part of the Bible was a mystery indeed. 